Summer cadet training at centers such as Vernon, Blackdown, Valcarche, and Argonaut have been taking place for over 70 years, training hundreds of thousands of cadets from across Canada. The training at these centers has evolved over those decades. Prior to the current six-week, highly structured summer training centers, there were the 10 to 14-day summer courses at much smaller and often temporary camps. Truly little is documented prior to the 1920s. However, we do know of a camp in Calgary before the First World War. A cadet camp was held on the outskirts of Calgary July 1 through 16, 1912, with 700 cadets under canvas at Reservoir Park. The park was located on the west side of Crowchild Trail along 33rd Avenue Southwest, immediately north of what would eventually become Curry Barracks. The site today is inner city and is a green space with tennis courts and a ball diamond. Few details are known of the training, but it can be assumed it likely revolved around the training syllabus of the day. In the 1920s, camps sprung up around the country. Mahone Park in North Vancouver, Cooking Lake and Morley in Alberta, Long Branch in Ontario, Island Park in New Brunswick, among others. These early camps served one or more cadet corps in the region, often grouping corps from the same city or immediate area. Niagara-on-the-Lake was perhaps the best organized from 1923 through 1947. Almost all were held under canvas and temporary in nature. In 1937, during the height of the Great Depression, at least 26 different summer camps operated across the country, with between 50 to 500 Army or Sea Cadets each. Clear Lake, Manitoba became one of those camps. The camp's first summer was in 1945. Clear Lake is located within Riding Mountain National Park, about 225 kilometers northwest of Winnipeg. The camp was situated on the north shore of the lake, about 5 kilometers northwest of the village of Waza Gaming, on land cleared by German POWs and a company of Royal Canadian Engineers during the Second World War. This is the summer of 1946. The cadets attending Clear Lake came from across Manitoba, eastern Saskatchewan, and from the Lakehead area of Ontario, arriving by a special excursion CPR passenger train. Documentation has survived as to the organizing structure of the camp, but is currently out of reach in Ottawa. This film is the best surviving bit of history. The cadets of the day were almost exclusively members of various school corps. They were issued the cadet khaki tunic and pants, khaki shirt, ankle boots, and cadet wedge. Once at camp, they were issued a pith helmet along with other gear needed for training. Some cadets brought their musical instruments, and an ad hoc band was formed to lead the cadets in parade, such as on this occasion just across the lake from the cadet camp, through the main street of the summer village of Waza Gaming on a sunny July evening. The camp was commanded by Major W. Cummings, District Cadet Officer from Winnipeg. Numerous Cadet Services of Canada officers from the school corps staffed the camp. Lieutenant W. H. Van Stickel, Lieutenant Bill Korchik, Lieutenant H. Murphy, Lieutenant G. Rogers, Lieutenant J. Dickison, Captain R. Porter, Captain John Pankew, Lieutenant J. D. McLeod, Lieutenant G. E. Duncan, all from Winnipeg, Captain R. B. Inkster from Fort William, and Captain R. C. Proctor from Fort Francis, Ontario, among others. Supporting the camp were personnel from the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps, cooks from the Royal Canadian Army Service Corps, under the supervision of Sergeant George St. John of Winnipeg, and other reservists in various driver and storesman's role for the summer. Cadets and staff lived in wartime heavy canvas bell tents with duckboard floors, a basic mattress, pillow, and two gray wool blankets. Rather basic, but this was the acceptable standard cadet camp sleeping accommodations at the time. Almost all the training was held outdoors. Physical fitness was a major component of daily training. Various sports such as softball, volleyball, tabloid sports, and boxing filled the days, building confidence and physical fitness.
There was plenty of range time on the rifle range firing the Lee Enfield No. 7 22 caliber rifle under close supervision and coaching from the officers. One of the big draws for cadets was the chance to work with military walkie-talkies, a significant piece of technology at the time. Signals training was fast becoming valuable training for cadets and would be well into the future. Of note, the boys in this film footage today are in their late 80s or early 90s. An unidentified brigadier likely from the Militia District 10 headquarters in Winnipeg, along with camp staff, inspects the whitewashed rock lined tent lines. The white building was possibly the dining hall. Accustomed to feeding large groups of hungry men, Sergeant George St. John expressed amazement at the ability of cadets to consume large quantities of food. We don't know where they put it, he said, but they certainly can hit the chow line and keep the staff busy. He revealed that to supply three meals per day, his staff uses approximately 200 gallons of milk, 250 pounds of meat, 200 loaves of bread, 400 pounds of potatoes, and 250 pounds of green vegetables.
Trucks from the Royal Canadian Army Service Corps are driven by militia soldiers and are the principal method of transporting cadets outside of marching. Forest conservation is one of the highlights of training with a visit to the forestry tower and lectures of tree seedlings and lumber, as well as the animals that populated the forest in the region. Studies in the theory of forestry receive their practical application when the cadets attend summer camp at Clear Lake. Because of its location in an experimental forest, the cadet camp is ideal for instruction in practical forestry, said Lieutenant J. Duncan of Winnipeg. Fundamental lessons can be taught in a way that impresses the boys and maintains their interest. According to Duncan, forestry studies provides an excellent vehicle for the teaching of citizenship, one of the main objectives of cadet instruction. Through forestry, we are able to illustrate our country's natural wealth and arouse a sense of citizen responsibility in protecting it from destruction of fire, insects, and careless harvesting, said Duncan. When the cadets arrive at the camp, their first lectures in forestry outline Canada as a forest empire. The value of this timber is stressed by pointing out that a peak net value of forest products was just over half a billion dollars. After the introductory lecture, said Captain Jay Pankew, a cadet instructor and Winnipeg school teacher, we take them to the forestry nursery where Mr. J.C. Goodison, the park's forest engineer, shows them planted seedlings. A pleasant, soft-spoken individual, Goodison is strongly in favor of teaching boys the problems of forestry. A knowledge of forestry gained while young will stay with an adult, and the problems of conserving and protecting forests would be reduced if more persons understood the true value of timber, said Goodison, as he guided a group of cadets through the nursery. Pointing to one bed, he said, Those tiny inch-high sprigs are seedling trees, and it's taken a little over a year for them to grow that big. Surprise was evident amongst the young group of cadets. From the seedlings, the cadets moved to a 70-year-old tree whose age was estimated by the cadets with the aid of Goodison and an increment bore which removed a small core from the tree, enabling the boys to count the rings. Nature was 70 years producing this tree. A fire could destroy it in five minutes, pointed out Captain Pankew. Methods of fighting forest fires and their equipment was the next step in the forestry studies. Chief Warden P.J. Brody turned out his equipment to the boys to operate. The system of fire towers used throughout Canada to protect the force was then explained and visit paid to one of the towers. Thus, what began as an experimental trip in 1943 when Mr. Hensley took the Earl Grey school cadets on a camping trip to the Sandylands Forest Reserve has grown into a planned movement to instruct young people in the wealth that is theirs. Swimming at the lake was an almost daily ritual, being only a few hundred yards from the camp.
church service was held in a natural amphitheater under the direction of Major J.P. Brown and Reverend K. Scott. The big event was the track and field meet, held on the camp with running, pole vaulting, high jump, and long jumping amongst other events.
The final parade with a brigadier reviewing officer and civilian dignitaries marked the formal end of training at Clear Lake with awards presented to deserving cadets. Meanwhile, at Army Headquarters in Ottawa, plans for an improved and more relevant Army Cadet Summer Camp program reflecting the changing times have been underway since the spring of 1946, under the direction of Captain Tony Stoppa and Captain G.G. Brown. In 1947, a new program will begin with implementation of a hybrid 10-day camp, followed by a six-weeks trades training program with about 1,000 cadets at Camp Ipperwash in southwest Ontario. In 1948, it will be deemed a success at Ipperwash, and the hybrid 10-day, six-week summer camp will be rolled out in 1949 at Aldershot, Nova Scotia, Farnham, Quebec, Dundurn, Saskatchewan, and Vernon, British Columbia, employing the former Second World War constructed basic infantry training camps at those locations. In 1950, the 10-day camp will be dropped, and those camps will offer only the six-week program. The new training programs in 1949 will include infantry basic training, driver mechanical, signals, engineering, fire control equipment, and medical assistant. These 10 to 14 day cadet camps under canvas will eventually be phased out entirely. Clear Lake will be one of the longest serving camps of this era. Its last summer will be 1966. In 1967, those cadets will now be attending at Vernon Cadet Camp. During those years, Clear Lake will have cadets attending from all four of the Western Provinces, the Yukon and the Northwest Territories on the two-week junior leader course introduced in the late 1950s. A final march pass is held in the village with a militia band leading, and the cadets are on their way home. Two more intakes of cadets will arrive during the balance of the summer and repeat the same training these cadets have just completed, taking home with them new skills and knowledge and memories that will last a lifetime. Today, virtually nothing remains of Clear Lake Cadet Camp.
just a faint outline of the few buildings that long ago occupied the camp, a handful of photos and memories. Nature is slowly reclaiming the tent pads, parking lot and foundations.